Hi everyone and welcome to Mankind vs Robots webinar where we'll be discussing the human side of prop tech. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel which consists of two of my fellow board members of the United Kingdom Prop Tech Association, Dominic and Christian, and also the host of this webinar, Home Heroes very own CEO, Kenny. For those who don't know me, my name is Louisa Dickens, co-founder of LMRE, the global prop tech recruitment firm, and I also host the PropCast which is a special property technology podcast, which you can find on Apple and Spotify. So if you're looking to hire or for a new role or looking for a really niche property technology podcast, then uh, reach out. But enough about me. It's time for a warm welcome to today's panel. So we have Home Hero CEO joining us today. So Kenny, why don't you kick us off a brief introduction to Home Hero and yourself? No, well, thank you, Louisa, for moderating and uh, super excited to, to speak at this, uh, this panel. So Home Hero, we are building a operating system for residential living. And so what we mean by that is we are bringing together the services, the software and the physical products that we believe will digitally enable homes um, going forward into the future. And the reason we're doing that is because we think that the experience of home is going to change over the coming years, especially post COVID. We think that residents deserve a, a much better elevated experience to make their lives far easier. And so we're a, a growing team working in a, quite an exciting space. And we wanted to host this event really because we think to achieve our mission, collaboration is going to be super key in prop tech. And in particular, we think that these types of forums are a great place to talk about collaboration, talk about how the, the, the space is changing and really invite people who might want to collaborate and discuss with us to reach out to us connect with us and um, yeah, join us for a, a broader conversation. So at the end of this, we'll obviously share the details of Home Hero, anyone excited by what we're doing. But I won't waste any more time because I think it's important this event is, is about the topic. So back to you, Louisa. Awesome, and uh, thank you for that, Kenny. Um, now, Dominic, if you could give a brief introduction to yourself, you know, let the audience know a little bit more about you and I guess your exposure to PropTuck over your um, solid career at Savills. Well, thank you, Louise. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Dominic Grace. I'm head of Savills London residential development team, certainly for a few months. I'm actually leaving Savills in June um, to set up my own advisory business. But uh, right now, still, um, and I, when I walk out the door, I would have done 37 years there. The vast majority of that involved in advi advising clients around uh, London residential development. Um, I've always taken a very keen interest in innovation though and sat in umpteen project meetings over many decades now thinking do you know what we could do things better so i'm very excited about what's happening now um and as kenny's already alluded to covid will have accelerated a lot of things that were going to happen anyway so uh really delighted to be on today's panel awesome thank you for that dominic and christian last but definitely not least um you have your own startup the depository can you tell us a little bit about you and obviously the business yeah, so um, I, first and foremost, I'm an agent of nearly 20 years, um, and uh, I've run my own estate and lettings agency for about 17, um, and very much part of that journey has been about how do we shape agency of the future? You know, where where is agency going? How do we deliver on the customer experiences and their expectations? How do we raise the standards of our industry? Um, and a lot of that has come through accepting that tech plays a critical role in that. So in the early days of our agency, I've been a big advocate of the technical evolution of our industry and our sector. Um, and that resulted in us deciding to build our own prop tech product, which we started about four or five years ago. We launched that product late 2019. Um, and that product, primarily, we've looked at the end of tenancy process. So when tenants vacate a property, um, which is an incredibly uh, sort of labor intensive role for an agent, an incredibly thankless task. And for landlords and tenants, it can be very sort of emotional um and stressful so we've looked at really how we can apply tech to transform that process for all um so we've looked at it from all three perspectives so for agents it's very much about streamlining operations um for tenants it's about bringing transparency and fairness to that process and for landlords it's about sort of guiding them through really what the regulatory and best practice framework is for that process so hopefully we've developed a product that that benefits all three sort of end users that go through that journey. Awesome. 
Thank you for that question. I'm sure you have. Um, I guess now we're all um, warmed up. Let's uh, start with the questions. So I thought a good place to start, which obviously talks about the man and the robot, the technology, is the pitching part and getting technology into real estate. So Dominic, you're the best person to start with for this. You must have had plenty of projects pitching to you since you're, I think you said 37 years at Savills, but also you know, we were earlier on a, an accelerator program pitch with Reach uh, Ventures. Um, what mistakes have you seen in startups sort of pitching and trying to sell their new technologies into companies like Savills? You're on uh, mute. Beg your pardon. Um, largely, Louise, it's, it's uh, the, the sort of failure, as it were, or the mist often made mistake is that a lot of businesses fail to have an intimate enough understanding of the way things are done at the moment. They may be quite right in, in uh, um, observing that, you know, they could be done better. That's fine. But to expect businesses to just drop wholesale systems that they've been using for a long time and really take a bit of a punt on something that might be a bit unproven is a very naive um, assumption. So my advice would always be make sure you, A, have a really good understanding of the way things are done at the moment and B, be super clear very early in any pitch you're making as to where the value uh, of your proposition lies. Because again, there's a lot of naivety about that. Um, and another observation is a lot of people are doing something that's, you know, a very small link in what is ultimately a very big chain. And the question is, is that one link ever really going to have a life of its own? Um, so just having a really good understanding of the way things are done and, and for a pragmatic view of, of how your system app, whatever it might be, is going to help very quickly. And last point, how easily will it be adopted by everyone in the business? How difficult is it to onboard effectively? And a uh, building on this, and it will bring um, obviously Kenny and Christian who, you know, have their own prop tech business in. My understanding and feedback from a lot of the technology companies is all the people are barriers. So real estate, senior management can often be obstacles or not completely on board of innovation, which obviously prevents, I guess, integ integration from happening. So it's a combination of maybe the tech not being there or the communication between the real estate and the prop tech companies. Um, Kenny, what, what's your experience being this? You must have had it since you've been, you've had two prop techs now of getting your product into real estate. Yeah, so I think um, Dominic has spoken some, some really clear truths. Um, the starting point, I reckon, is is actually all about value. So I think people, sometimes it's easy to forget that property and property businesses, be it property agents or, or landlords, they're ultimately looking to create value in their businesses. So I think it's super important that whatever you bring to market, it, it's clear what that return is for the, the audience. Mm -hmm. Super, super clear what the return is. I think it's also really important that you're starting or building a business that isn't trying to be everything. I think collaboration is so important because as Dominic described, there are lots of historical tools that groups will already use. And so trying to unseat those tools is, is, is just not a smart move, but trying to extend and enable their processes in, in, in new ways, I think is, is always smart for, for, for startups. Certainly our belief is that at least. And then I, I also think a point that's been raised already, but a very good one is the barriers to entry have got to be low. So taking on the product, starting to use it, it it's got to be easy. It's got to be easy, straightforward, and easily implemented across different organizations. And finally, I think it's super important that, you know, you don't have tech just for the sake of tech. I think we, we live in a time now where tech is just such an exciting buzzword that mm. they're so excited by it. And, and they forget that, you know, technology is just a tool. Um, we had tools back in prehistoric times and we have tools now. And so ultimately those tools that you we, you provide, they, they have to enable and support the stakeholders and they certainly can't threaten them. So whether that's the top of the organization or or the individuals using your product, they've got to be supportive of, of, of embracing it. Otherwise, you're, you're pretty much done before you start it. So that, that's kind of my view. Um, and you talk about... Um easy to use tech this is something that's christian 
often talks about and you know how do you actually make it simple for real estate users i'm not a real estate broker i'm not a real estate agent i once was at foxons in the glory days but um in reality how easy is it does it christian you might be able to give us a use case of this so look i don't i don't think this is per se something specific to prop tech right i think i think any good tech design should be an intuitive interface you know you think about the last app you downloaded onto your phone yes. mm -hmm. you don't need you don't need to download a 30 page pdf to understand how to use that app when you download an app you log in register that will usually take you through some sort of setup wizard you might have a little bit of tutorials embedded in there but by and large you pull on the sort of navigation that people are used to when using products so it becomes intuitive and natural um and and that should be applied to any prop tech product you know i think as a prop tech business you've got a couple of things that you've really got to consider and and both in terms of you as a business and the agency you're selling into so for you as a business if you run a product that is really difficult to understand and learn how to use you're going to have to spend a vast amount of time and money training your agents and users and going back and training them every time you do a change every time they have staff changes um, you're also going to have to have a massive support team because they are constantly going to get stuck at areas and again they're not going to want to wade through a 20 30 50 page pdf document or submit a request to a support team and wait two days to get a reply so for you as a prop tech business investing in intuitive easy to use software is going to save you massively on resources and then really the same transfers into that agency how easy is it for them to, for them to embed how easy is it for their staff to use it for them to train new members of staff you know really you want a product that you ideally train that company once and then each time they have a member of staff change or a new member of team come in they can easily bring that new member of staff onto that platform and again it just makes it intuitive seamless it becomes a core part of that company's dna and again as a prop tech company you're not being expected to provide what is ultimately a very expensive human resource to facilitate that does it um it was a question i was gonna go on to a bit later but i'm gonna ask it now um is it fully the property technologies company and responsibility to obviously you integrate it you train the say savils as use as use case how to use um the product or is it also now down to com a combined effort from the real estate world to the technology world so savils should start employing people to work with the startups and also embracing a culture of adoption you know trying to get brokers surveyors agents to try and think more digitally and work out how can they maybe use this product better what so i think, think fundamentally it's a bit of both right i think uh, i think it is a little bit of both as, as dominic talked about earlier and it's something i've i've sort of shouted quite a lot about over the last sort of five six years is there's been a lot of products that have come out of uh, a very singular experience particularly in the lettings market oh i had a terrible experience with this landlord or this managing agent or this letting agent whatever it is i'm going to build an app that transforms it and usually that means you know restricting the landlord cutting the agent out the process etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's all very much about a perception of why that problem happened and a very simplistic overview of oh if we cut all those parties out we get what we want um you know as, as dominic alluded to you have got to have a deep understanding first of all of the regulatory framework of the industry you're selling into your product has got to be compliant that's first and foremost secondly you have to have an understanding generally of agency operations you know if you think if you if you're going to set out and your ambition is to say every agent in the country does this wrong I'm going to teach you how to do it right. Good luck. <laughs> Whereas if you turn around and go, guys, do you know what? I get why you do it this way. But if we just make this 20% change, you guys will see a double return or you'll be able to cut your you know, staff resources in half or whatever it is. Then you've mm -hmm. got something transactional. But it, so, so it's on both. So prop techs, you know, whatever stage you're at, 
have someone involved in your business, be it a consultant, be it a, a founder, a stakeholder, whatever it is, but someone who understands in depth the market you're selling into. But also from the company sides, and really this needs to come from the top down. I think small independents are good at this because you have, you know, like myself and I, my agency, there's me and my founder, we can make decisions very quickly. So we can see a product, we can test it. And if we don't like it, it doesn't deliver six months, a year later, we can cut that out and move on. Mm. For the big businesses, there is, there is a problem around a lack of strategy and structure as to their approach. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be proven wrong, but I think if you took the 10 biggest estate agents and asked all of them on a panel to set out in two to three sentences what their tech strategy is for the next 10 years within their residential operations, I'm gonna say that most, if not all of those would not be able to answer you. And, and therein lies the problem. And if you don't have that structure at the top, then you can't facilitate everything down, which determines how you survey the market, how you identify opportunities, how you partner with everything from early stage and startups to mature businesses, and how you go, you know, and how you go through that journey with them. Um, I know, you know, one of the things, one of the very common hurdles that a lot of medium and bigger agencies put in front of prop techs is, are you integrated with our CRM? You know, I, I know that when I say that, every prop tech listening to this and probably every decision maker in an agency listening to this is sort of half moaning, half eye rolling, <laughs> half, <laughs> half chuckling to themselves. Um, because the reality is, yes, integrated solutions into a CRM is obviously the gold standard everybody wants to. We don't have what's called an open API sort of network across all CRMs. So there isn't this ability for products to just plug and play and agents can use them. Um, for most CRMs, it's a very convoluted process of either joining a very long queue um, of, you know, just working through a list of who they're going to integrate with um, or a big, a big check to get you to the front of that queue or, you know, whatever it is. But I think a lot of a lot of property companies have got to understand that actually a CRM integration is going to be something that happens quite late in a tech products um, development journey. Um, and so if you want to be an innovator, if you want to be an early stage adopter, if you want to be leading how property evolves through tech rather than following everyone, you're going to have to let go of things like that. You're going to have to understand that that is something that's going to happen six months a year two years four five years down the line mm. um, if you're a big agent you might be able to drive that decision you know if you really love a product and you are a big player in the game you've got a huge voice so you're able to go back to your crm and go by the way you are integrating with this product this year um i think actually something generally that needs to happen in the in the real estate market is because crm integration is something every agent wants agents as a whole need to be going to their CRMs more and constantly nagging and driving home the request for an open API. Um, because ultimately they are the CRMs clients, what they say goes, and that's what will drive that shift. Um, there is, you know, there are some operators in there in the residential space, that sort of obvious ones are Desres, Agent OS, Repit Foundations are building their, their open sort of app store style marketplace at the moment. Um, MRI are taking a very fast approach to partners and integration. So the industry's come on a long way from where it was three years ago, but we're still nowhere near where we need to be. Um, and agents have a big role in playing that. If they really want integrated products in their CRMs, which a lot of them, that is quite an immediate reason to say, do you know what, come back to me in a year's time or two years time or whenever you get integrated. Um, you guys are the, are the pivot in resolving that issue. Go to your CRM and demand that they create an open API so that partners can plug in as and when. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting point to make. Christian, I guess th there is also uh, what drives that, right? So a very clear business case, because I think it's hard for property agents to go to their CRMs and sometimes be told that there's going to be a three-month lead time or, or, or what have you. 
without really quantifiable what is the rate of return of in integrating this product. And I think that's often a challenge for startups is being able to clearly articulate by using my product, this is what it's going to mean for your business. Um, often it, it, it tends to be kind of nice to have um, as opposed to this is going to affect my bottom line and then move my business forward. So I think that's kind of a, a point to add to that, really. Sorry. So just as something to add on to that, um, rolling out our product, CRM integrations is something agents have asked a lot of. We, we've already rolled out six partner integrations in the last 12 months, and none of them have been a CRM. Um, and the reason we've gone back to our agents and we've said is that as an agent, that's the really obvious one. I'll pull across my landlord and property data and great, I don't need to type it in. But the reason we've left that to last is that the partner integrations we've done deliver far more value in our process than a CRM integration does. Like We know when we get to a CRM integration, that will typically save an agent two to three minutes per transaction. Um, we've just rolled out three integrations with three major inventory provider partners, Inventory Hive, Inventory Basin, and No Letting Go. And those partner integrations will save agents on average about an hour per transaction. So that's why we prioritize that over CRM integration. So sometimes it is about educating your agent. Sometimes, you know, as a business, you've got to understand what problem you're solving and where the real value add is. You know, our agents have been super delighted about those partner integrations. And when we've gone back and gone, guys, this is why we've done this and why we've pushed CRM integrations further down the road, they've come back going, awesome. You know, that that's much better than a CRM integration. So yeah, we're happy to wait. But part, so partner integration, so I know Kenny, touched on earlier as well you know understanding your eco space it's not all about the big crm systems there is a lot of value add to be had from you know and as we've talked about that we've got a marketplace of increasingly sort of micro solutions really tackling very specific parts of the property chain and as dominic said you know there are pluses and challenges you know benefits and challenges to that um I think the benefit is that typically that solution will have a very detailed understanding of that small part of the process, but it is very insular. But then when you plug that in with other similar style products around that ecosystem that you're working in, you then get a really rich ecosystem of, of five, six, seven products that tackle different elements in that one process timeline in an ecosystem but all deliver incredible value and user journeys within them because of their special knowledge and through partnering and integrating you get this incredible journey so and um, talking about i guess user journeys i quite want to go how and you know kenny and christian you can probably talk in detail about this you always talk, your products talk about making the lives of residents easier so how close do you actually get to your tenants when building these products? Um, and and how, how do you ensure that the end user is always in mind, especially as we're remote working and you're building your businesses from, from your home? Maybe, Kenny, you can go first. Yeah, I think if you'd asked this question 10 plus months ago, it would have been really easy to answer that, right? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. The world wasn't quite the way it is now. But look, we we, we as a business and myself as a, as a founder have a history of you know, putting service and technology in front of consumers. And so we're really focused on a couple of things, really. So having a really tight feedback loop on the interactions that we have with, with users, making sure that we actually read out, reach out and build out panels of potential users as well. Um, we use services such as sort of uh, online usability studies. We really make an effort to get in front of people and, you know, validate our assumptions even as we were building out the core insight around Home Hero, we, we met with the best part of 60 to 100 people who we felt were part of the, the profile of customers that we were after. I think it is super important if you're building a business that you're always talking to users. And I think it's a struggle more so now in COVID because obviously people won't meet you in person for, for obvious reasons, but there are still things that you can do. And we as a business are really keen on investing in, in speaking to as many people as we can so that we're, we're always optimizing our model um i guess christian you might have had similar experiences in terms of physically meeting people but. yeah i mean i've always found like asking people for feedback is always really dangerous um <laughs> because you don't know the motives behind what they say 
Like, are they telling you what you want to hear because they just don't like confrontation? Um, do they actually know what they're talking about? You know, and a very singular experience doesn't necessarily represent a whole. So, you know, I am a firm believer that any business should constantly continue to evolve. I think that is particularly true in tech. You know, any good tech product, again, you think about your smartphone, your apps, how regularly you will get an update that constantly evolves that product and, and keeps moving that forward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always concerned when you see, you know, you see a prop tech product that's been in the marketplace and two or three years after being demoed it, you get shown it again. And it is pretty much exactly the same product that you see that you saw two or three years ago. Um, we've always, you know, our, our journey to date and, and admittedly we're, we're early in our journey. We try and establish what we can from looking at user behavior. So we use quite a cool, uh, service called Hotjar, um, which captures user activity on our platform. So it gets, it captures heat maps, which shows basically where people go on our platform. We can also, it captures random visits to our platform and actually records that user journey navigating around. Um, and reviewing that at regular occasions has led us um, pre-launch to actually completely redesign our interface before we launched, we actually put about our launch like nine months and spent about a third of what we'd already invested in the platform completely redesigning our interface. Because when we look back at these recordings, what we found was, you know, there were all these recordings of a mouse cursor just going all over this screen as people were trying to figure out what they did next. Where was the button they needed to click? Um, so I think there's, there's tools like that. Um, we also look at any email that comes in um, from a user to an agent we're we're blind copied into so we can see what that what that email is about and then we will very quickly assess whether that whether we see that as a perceived um, sort of usability issue or if it's something relating to the agent if it's something relating to the agent specifically then of course it's nothing to do with us but again we look for patterns so if we see in a week two weeks multiple landlords come back going oh, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing now or, um, oh, I thought I'd already done this or whatever. For me, that is red flagging that something isn't clear enough. Something isn't obvious and, and um, yeah, it's just not easy enough for the, the person to use. And that flags us looking at an issue. Um, I mean, we've, we've just literally yesterday uh, flagged a major review of, of the core sort of function of our platform, which is proposing and negotiating deductions on a, on a, on a property when you vacate, you know, and we're looking at that because we started at a very, very evidence fact based level, which is great, but we're starting to see tenancies now where, I mean, that's fine if you've got like five things deducted, but we're starting to see tenancies now where there's 30 or 40 proposed deductions which is an overwhelming list for anyone to look at and to go through. So we're now sort of brainstorming, what does that navigation look like? What, what's navigation 2.0 in that journey? And how can we shrink that down? You know, we, mm. we work in deductions in like five or six categories. So what we're looking at now is, can we take those 30 things and actually make it a maximum of those five or six category charges that you see. So you just see an overview and then you can sort of expand at a granular, on a granular basis to get more data if you want it. But the reality is, you know, a tenant who's, who's presented with 30 deductions, actually they don't fundamentally care about every single individual deduction. All they care about is that total amount. Right, my landlord wants 700 quid of my money. You know, they don't fundamentally care exactly what of that list of 30 they are or aren't liable for all they want to know is what they can get that figure down to and so we're you know we're, we've started the journey on how we look at that and that's that's something we won't look at probably doing anything with for at least six to nine months mm. but we're starting that journey now we're looking at it we flagged it with our dev team um with the ux designers you know with our guys um just to look at that and start putting that apart. And I think you've, you've got to constantly be doing that. How do you make it better? How do you make it more intuitive? Yeah, but I guess alongside with making real estate or agency or whatever vertical project we're talking about, it's all about making it more efficient and a lot, 
I would say it's a concern of the real estate world, even though you're making it efficient, are you cutting um, some jobs out? Are you cutting jobs out of agents? And I'd love to bring Dominic in, especially Dominic hasn't spoken for about 10 minutes, which is crazy, about is we've seen obviously job losses happen when, you know, the FinTech or the travel tech, uh, but what I've seen, even though traditional roles may go, there's other roles like account management, um, customer success, business development, a lot of these roles which do, one, you need um, industry knowledge, but also you need that human element, that emotion, emotional filtering, you know, un- or just general understanding of the industry. Uh, Dominic, what's your thoughts on whether, and maybe it could be general sort of Savile's agent's thoughts on whether jobs are being created or um, at risk? Well, um, happily, Savills, I can say, is in in great shape. Um, But that's not to say every agent is. In fact, one we all know that's not the case. So there's some real laws of the jungle going on out there. Um, But Savills' business is in great shape. Um, What you won't see Savills doing, which other firms, big firms, uh, have said is, uh, you know, pretending perhaps that we're a tech business that happens to be the, in the real estate space. Mm. We're not. And it loops right back to the main question that this event is about, is that wow, uh, Savile's aware of the importance of the human touch. So we're forever refining that bit of our service, whilst sure, absolutely being very aware of what tech can be brought to bear to actually improve that human piece rather than sort of push uh, buyers or applicants or whatever away and, and them feeling that they're just doing everything on a on a phone or whatever. So, and look, there's le- plenty of evidence um, from so far the evolution of the online agents um, that the problems, if, if you push the tech too hard, do you know what, you won't succeed. Um, and for mm. those who don't know, for example, Savills give you some idea of how front foot they've been in terms of investing in technology are one of the main shareholders in Yopa, for example. Some people find that very surprising that on the face of it, a very <laughs> traditional agent, why have they invested their hard earned cash into what might seem to be a competitor? Well, the answer is that because we are uh, on the front foot and we're l- learning a lot from Yopa and two way traffic, as it were. Um, and I, I think everyone would agree that the success of online agency is going to be ensuring that you get the human bit right. And, you know, look at what Viewber have brought to the party and stuff. It's all about bringing people to have that interface with the, let's face it, if you're talking about lettings and sales in residential, quite often it is an intimidating you know, stressful period for the prospective tenant, buyer, whatever all the more reason that that you know soothing helpful human bit uh, is going to be brought to bear and i think that's going to prove to be ever thus actually mm. i think we're also we're we're making it out like technology is perfect surely like kenny and christian you must have a lot of use cases where your technology has screwed up it hasn't been perfect your product is flawed you've had to sort of ever change it like every within any business my business is so flawed and you have to keep on changing it what you know yeah. what can you do to perfect that <laughs> yeah i think it's a really good point we we can't pretend that technology solves all problems um <laughs> I said earlier you know technology's taken on this almost mythical term these days and people think it's it's just it's magic or or, or, or something akin to that. But the reality of it is, I agree with a lot of what Dominic said, which is that I think technology plays a part with property in, in really helping property stakeholders, members of staff elevate their experience by helping them reduce, reduce the things that they would have to do. So, you know, helping get out of the way the more sort of mundane things, the things that are sucking up a lot of time, the things that ultimately aren't necessarily creating that that value with those human interactions you know a good example of what we see is if you run a building or or you run a uh, you're a landlord you want to be able to communicate with your residents um, at key moments right you want to be able to highlight and build really positive relationships with them all the way down to things like knowing what day you know it's it's their birthday if you run a building uh, in a high-end sort of build to rent you don't want to be sitting there filling out forms and making Mm. uh, admin sort of effort you want to use technology to really get out of your own way so that you can elevate the experience and i think dominic might agree but a firm like savills 
that really is what technology is going to do for them. It's going to it's going to extend them. It's going to give them leverage. And I, I reckon that's the case for most of property. Um, we talked a lot about the large groups and how they might not have technology strategies. I suspect that most technology, that most large groups know that they, they want to change. They know they want to be better and want to embrace technology. But ultimately, they are a people business, first and foremost. And so the technology has got to, it's got to help them be more of a people business, not actually replace the people that's kind of my stance on it so yeah i'm working on and i've seen it especially since the last year everyone says put oh, a lot of prop techs are talking about how it's pushed forward their adoption and sales rates of their product um last year since the year of covid i've seen it from a recruitment angle so i can actually firsthand say these big real estate investment funds global agencies are now all coming to us to hire head status transformation data scientists innovation managers and they actually finally have a budget and sign off to work out how on earth do we integrate how on earth do we like digitally transform and keep up and service our tenants or whatever it could be so things are happening which is hopefully great for um the prop tech industry and um, i would like to we're, we're coming probably to about the last 10 minutes of the webinar so i thought we'd sort of open up um the conversation a little bit more and you know dominic during your years at um Savills, years of pictures, whether they've been perfect, slightly flawed. Um, you must have seen plenty of products like that, but also know what is needed in agency, in residential development. Is there a certain product out there you've uh, caught your eye or, you know, which are really sort of um, helping uh, residents at the moment or in the development space? Well, the answer is there are a lot of um, products out there. And as Christian's alluded to, and it's the same in, in the whole sort of wider um, sort of web, as it were, of different platforms servicing different sectors, be it resi sales, lettings, ongoing management, et cetera. That all that you know, ecosystem, much uh, used word appropriate to that. Um, I mean, for example, a business that I'm already advising, independent of my Savills role, is Yorkies. Some of you will be familiar with that. Mm. Um, well, do you know what's impressed me about Yorkies is not just that the tech's really good and the amount of work that Ricardo Iannucci Dawson, the founder of that business, has put into making sure that the interface, picking up on what I said earlier, with the CRM platforms, it does talk to Repit, it does talk to Salesforce, it does talk to Coins, which is a um, the system a lot of house builders use. He's done all that heavy lifting. He makes sure mm. it, it has a good interface with the uh, conveyances, uh, case management systems, etc. But do you know what? The other thing, ironic again, considering what we're talking about, is that Ricardo himself is a super impressive guy. And yeah. you can just tell he so I mean, it's a boring thing to say, but it is so true. Lots of people might have a brilliant idea, a fantastic bit of tech. But if they themselves haven't got the business acumen and resilience and ability to pitch to the money that's going to back them, they're going to fail. So. Uh, for me, if you like a prospective buyer of prop tech, I'm looking for not just the tech, but the quality of the people behind that tech. Yeah, I guess it's finding that balance, especially between two co-founders as well. And um, that's feedback, which I've heard a lot. But it's also for um, when you're hiring for your own team as well. People buy into, obviously, the product, but the vision which is created by the founders and how they're credible they are pure sort of leadership. Um, one final question which is directed at all of you. And we touched on it earlier, but Kenny and Chris, you didn't um, sort of delve into it a little bit too much. Do you think the industry needs to keep up or do prop techs need to make adjustments? And, you know, Dominic sort of answered a little bit, but uh, Kenny, why don't you um, let us know your thoughts on that? Slightly controversial, and it's probably going to be a bit of a hybrid answer. Well, I, I think the answer is pretty straightforward, which is it, it really depends on whether you want to succeed or not. I mean, if you want to succeed, then as a prop tech, you, you have to adopt because, you know, the industry is a set of structure already. The industry is not going to change quickly. And so if you want to get adoption and get traction, then it's inevitable. You, you, you have to adapt and make sure that your product is fit for the market. I think it's a, a difficult thing to go any other path, really. Um, so pretty straightforward answer for me. Yeah. And Christian? 
Yeah, I mean, I agree. Any ecosystem, right? It's, it's about advancements in all of them. So um, I think the nice thing with PropTech, you know, you, as you just alluded to, Louisa, particularly this pandemic has driven forward the need for agents to start doing what's been talked about for the last five years. So bringing in, hiring people with a specific role around tech and the tech strategy and culture of a business and, and mm. driving that forward. Um, equally, the product, um, the prop tech product space is constantly getting better. And that's driven by, by really a couple of things. You've got people like Kenny who've, been there done that you know they've done one or two products and they're now on and you know each business they're doing they're learning and doing things differently and more succinctly um you've also got a wave of people like myself who have come from an agency background understanding tech um you know we've we've done the depository there's a brand new product being rolled out now called agent response by a guy called michael nettleton um who owns an agency up north called knock and knock and dayton um and you know the great thing with that was that came from a real business problem they were absolutely overwhelmed by lettings inquiries to the point where they just could not service them they could not answer all of them let alone actually register someone and get them all out on viewings so they developed a product that solved that problem for their own business there was no ambition beyond that they developed a product it's worked brilliantly they then started to uh, talking to a couple of agents they know and they were like oh let us have a look we'll sign up um, they got such an amazing reaction. They've now created Agent Response. I think mm -hmm. in the last two weeks, they've signed up 30 brands. Oh, wow. You know, so they are going fast because it's a boots on ground product. It's built by an agent who understands a very real agent problem and has built a product to solve that problem. You know, you've also got Kai Wheatley, the founder of Keaton's in London. He rolled out Area, I think two about a year and a half two years ago and again fundamentally come from an agent experience running a good mid-size agency and i understanding a real friction point in that business reaching out to a couple of other agents and going you have this too right and those agents going yeah absolutely and and kai like me has gone off and built a product very specifically with a view of of, of creating a business to sell to agents but from that mindset of i run a business this is a problem i validated that problem as something other agents share and i'm going to solve that from a point of knowledge and understanding so the marketplace is maturing um, and that means better products, better developed, better understanding of the things we've talked about or operational, um, you know, operational style within businesses, regulatory framework, et cetera. So I think we just it, it should get better and better. Right. The product should get better and the agent's approach to tech should get better, which in turn sort of dials up the improvement. You know, if you've got mm. a, a, a two times better prop tech product and an agent with a twice as good pro approach to prop tech whatever that means in theory <laughs> you're sort of improving by four times right rather than doubling so i think you know as a marketplace evolves it gets better i'm sure if we went back and looked at the very first apps we downloaded on our very first iphone we'd be like oh, what the hell is that <laughs> and you look at the products you download now you know whether it's something to help you shop or whether it's a you know a computer mm. game or whatever and the stuff you download on your phone in a few seconds is incredible and i think that's that's just the natural evolution so i think it's it's a constantly improving space um and and the leaders on both sides real estate and tech are the ones really driving that into an into an ever better ever more exciting sort of space can I chip in here something as well? Because we, we chatted a lot about agents and I guess a lot of the audience would have thought, right, well, we're really talking about sort of mainstream agency, the sort of B to C bit. Of course, one's got to be very conscious that particularly with the whole build to rent market going on, that agents themselves are going to be disintermediated, disrupted with big landlords targeting directly prospective tenants or indeed big developers targeting directly prospective buyers um so the onus is on agents to in order to justify their existence and make sure that they're not cut out of the loop to do everything that much better and particularly the human bit um which i'm generalizing a bit here a lot of developers are historically not very good at that the customer care bit um 
and for the big build to rent landlords to build their brands which a lot of them have big aspirations to do and for that brand to carry some sort of premium perhaps or loyalty which means people stay there more or their friends come and live in the building whatever it might be building that brand as we all know is all about the human stuff not about the tech so there's yeah. some, you know there's some interesting stuff going on out there beyond the pure lettings and and secondhand uh, sales agents piece um, is there anyone to add anything more to that as well whilst we're before we come to the end of the I think webinar? The only, the, I think the only thing I would add to that is is a massive misconception actually from people who come into this space from outside real estate. There's a huge misunderstanding about the structure of the business. So um, Dominic's just talked about build to rent. That is massively gathering pace. But at the moment, I mean, there's an estimated roughly 100,000 build to rent units either complete or under construction. Uh, which would represent about two and a half percent of the PRS, which is about four million homes. So, yes, it's a significant element, but it's it's not huge. And yes, that will grow, but I can't see that getting past ten percent really within the next twenty thirty years. That's it's going to have to be a lot of building to do that. Um, what is really important is if you're a supplier coming into this marketplace, I think the perception is that agency is dominated by sort of ten brands. And then there's independence got sort, of, sort of scattered around. Now, this does vary depending on what marketplace you're playing in. But typically in UK residential agency, most people, the perception is that 80% of the market is corporate and 20% of the market is independent. Whereas actually the opposite is the truth. 20% of the market is corporate and 80% of the market is independent. And of that 80%, the vast majority of those businesses are one to three branch businesses. So... Um, if you're a prop tech coming into this space, you need to understand that because if you need volume for your business to work, you need to understand that you're going to be selling into, there's roughly 12,000 branches on each sales and lettings in the UK um, in, in the residential agency space. Uh, and if you think 80% of that is independence, you need to understand that if your viability is that you need 30% of the market, you not only have to pick up every big corporate to give you that 20% lead, but if you've still got to capture another 10%, that's still 1,200 branches that you mm -hmm. need to capture into your business to hit that 30%. So um, I think that's a really common misconception I've seen operating within the prop tech space and particularly within the UK PA is talking to either businesses coming over that have been successful in other countries and it's very, in a lot of other countries, they are corporate dominated. Um, and a lot of them don't understand the, the completely opposite structure of the UK property market here. So I think a lot of businesses, whether they're coming from abroad or they're startups here, they don't have that in-depth understanding. And so you need to understand the complexities of selling into such a fragmented market. And as we've touched on here, the benefit of a product, you know, we, we sell our product into everything from a single branch I think the smallest client we've taken on so far has just 20 managed properties. That's our smallest. Um, and we're currently in the process of, of talking to one of the three largest managing agents in the country. Um, yeah. So, but those pitches are very, very different. What is mm. gonna work for a startup independent? I'm not gonna be saying the same things to a nationwide corporate agent that you know the difference are very the, the changes are very different and we talked about earlier does prop tech mean less bums on seats potentially not in a single agency you know the likelihood that a single branch with three to six staff is going to sign your product and then sack a member of staff is highly unlikely if anything mm -hmm. they're just going to leverage that staff member transition them into a different role or get them to do something different that said you pitch a product into a corporate agency and that is a very real consideration you know we we don't advocate staff reduction but in the biggest of operations we reckon that um you know the teams that they have running this we can reduce their workforce by about 25 to 30 percent with ease um and that gives an roi a, a very clear financial roi on our product of about 600 percent roi but that we couldn't possibly pitch that to an independent single branch agency. It's a very different premise. So you can have one product, but you need to understand who you're selling into and, and what the benefit is to that business because a single branch is not going to be the same as a corporate.
Yeah, I think Christian's definitely right that, you know, property is not one massive market. It's lots of little markets and lit sort of subsectors and segments. I, I do think, though, sort of to, to end on a really positive note, one, <laughs> one more positive thing about property, though, is that property groups in, in many ways are homogenous, right? If you're a property manager, whether you're a lettings manager of a, of a one branch letting agency or, you know, a, a thousand branches, your ultimately your job is is to serve landlords and it's to serve your residents. And so I do think that startups can build momentum on the fact that once they're in an industry and they're building credibility, then it can quickly become something that the industry sees as, as a must have. And so I think that's a really positive note for anyone who is who is looking at sort of doing something in prop tech in in the UK that, you know, there are these inflection points. So it's always worth, you know, being ambitious and and uh, yeah, building a, a compelling business. So, yeah, wonderful. Kenny, thank you so much for uh, letting us finish on a high. Um, but sadly, we are coming to the end of the Home Heroes webinar on the human side of prop tech. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Nana, who you can't see her beautiful face, but she organised all of this. So thank you for that and, yeah, organising it. And thank you for the audience for turning up. And um, if you want to contact any of our, our wonderful panel, they I'm sure they'd love to hear from you if you have any questions about their businesses or speak to Dominic about, you know, his career at Savills, but also his new consultancy or the UKPA or LMRE. Just reach out to all of us. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening thank you Louisa. thanks a lot guys have a good one see you bye